Members will call to order the Committee on Jobs and Economic Development. It is Monday, March 25th, and we have a quorum. Today, we will hear Senate File 4182 from Senator Fate, Senate File 4401 from Senator Umu Verbaten, Senate File 4816 from Senator Dornick, Senate File 3167 for me, Senate File 4914 from Senator Hearst, Senate File 4609 from Senator Hostrild, and Senate File 4869 from our chair champion. As you can see, we have a very full agenda, so we will be limiting all testifiers to two minutes. For your reference, Senator Draham and Senator Nelson are both joining us via Zoom. Uh, and we will call on Senator Draham first. Thank you, Chair. I was just wondering, what is the intent um, for all the bills? Are they all being laid over? Senator Durham, we will be laying everything over today. Thank you. Thank you. And Senator Fate, please uh, present Senate File 4182. And I believe we have uh, Electra on Zoom. I have no clue how to say her last name. Awesome. Thank you so much, um, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, last session, the legislature established the Community Wealth Building Grant uh, Program as a pilot with MCCD administering a $3 million loan fund. Um, SF4182 makes small changes to the program, including adding in a forgivable loan requirement up to 15% for eligible borrowers, uh, allowing the program to offer fee-based lending, and requests a small one-time appropriation of $350,000 to support the necessary outreach, education, and training to support the long-term success of the program. By creating this program dedicated to supporting shared ownership businesses, Minnesota can provide solutions for some of our state's looming economic questions. For example, shared ownership models can create ownership opportunities for communities that don't have access to traditional financing mechanisms, mechanisms or generational wealth. They also help prevent displacement, revitalize tax bases, preserve affordability, grow and retain businesses or jobs, provide a path for baby boomers to sell, to sell businesses to their employees, and strengthen local economies. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more about how this work is progressing from, my te from the testifier. Uh, Elektra Shetletsky, uh, the Director of Ownership, the Metropolitan Consortium of Community Developers. Thank you, Senator Fate. Electra, if you can introduce yourself for the record, and you can begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair Mohammed. Uh, my name is uh, Electra Strudletsky. I'm the Director of Shared Ownership for the Metropolitan Consortium of Community Developers and a constituent of Senator Champions. Last year, the legislature enacted the Community Wealth Building Loan Program and designated MCCD as the pilot's administrator. As a reminder, the program helps target resources to help entrepreneurs and community-owned businesses um, that are owned by immigrants, women, Black, Indigenous, people of color, veterans, people with disabilities, and other low-wealth individuals start or convert existing businesses to a shared ownership model. Since the enactment of the program, I was hired to help expand the shared ownership work statewide. We've been holding monthly information sessions and ramping up outreach in the second quarter. Additionally, we've been meeting with organizations and municipalities to help spread the word. I have presented to the Minnesota, Minnesota Association of Workforce Boards and met with the Director of Business Retention, who leads the succession planning and retention program at the University of Minnesota's Extension. Currently, we have three businesses we are working with to provide technical assistance and prepare loan applications. This bill would make a few policy adjustments and allocate a small direct appropriation to MCCD. First, the bill would add in a 15% forgivable loan addition. As we work to ensure that Minnesotans know about shared ownership, we see forgivable loans and our low interest rates as powerful incentives. Second, the model would allow for the loans to be more inclusive by using a fee-based lending model. Third, we are requesting a, third, a small one-time appropriation. Historically, shared ownership has not been an easy business model for folks to navigate, but that's where we, along with our partners, come in. Our goal is to help eliminate those barriers to starting or converting shared ownership businesses. And the supplemental funding will help MCC with the amount of outreach, education, training, and technical assistance that's needed for the program to be a success beyond the pilot phase. 
So I thank you very much, Senator Fateh, for carrying this bill, and thank you, Chair Mohammed, and the committee for your support of expanding resources for shared ownership businesses. And I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Electra. Um, members, any questions for Senator Fateh or his testifier? Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm just I'm just trying to catch up on this bill a little bit. Um, you know, one comment before I have a question, and I know we talked about this. I think it was last week on um, um, on line 1.17. The fee or interest rate shall not be higher than the Wall Street Journal prime rate. We had a lot of discussion regarding other loan programs, whether that should be prime plus two or prime or where it's currently as high as prime plus four. And I think there should be some consistency as we move forward, um, aligning all of these uh, options together. Um, but I think my, Madam Chair, if I may, my, my question's a little more, um, a, a little simpler than that. Um, the title of the bill is a wealth building grant program pilot project. I'm not seeing um, is is the appropriation in, in section three to the loan program or is there truly a grant program that's being um, created in this in this legislation? I'm a little confused with just how it's written and laid out. Senator Pratt, we will let Senate Fiscal answer that. Uh, Madam Chair and members and Senator Pratt, so this is not a statutory program since it was a pilot. Um, it was in the session law from last year, and so it's uncodified, but it is called the Community Wealth Building Grant Program, uh, pilot program. So. If you looked at the session law from last year, it lays out the different parameters for this pilot, and it is appropriating additional money to that pro the pilot that was established in the session law. So I'm not sure if that makes sense or it gets to your question, but um, if if you go back to see what this the bill is amending, it's in that session law and it lays out more of the criteria and and the program parameters. So it's putting more money into the program. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. So either to Ms. Uh, Doyle Fontaine or, or to the author, it looks like the structure of it is a loan program, not a grant program as I typically think of it. And I think that's where my confusion is coming, coming from, where we talk about a grant program pilot project, but the details seem to be a revolving loan program where at least 50% of the, of the payments are uh, reinvested back into the corpus. Madam Chair. Senator Fateh or your testifier, can you say your name for the record of you and tell us the answer? Uh, yes, uh, Chair Mohammed. My name is Carrie Johnson. Um, I am the Director of State Policy and Field Building um, at MCCD and just wanted to provide a little more context. So this bill was originally written uh, to become a competitive grant program or a competitive program at DEED um, and meant to then allocate out resources. So grant resources to organizations to then loan out. Um, so that is why it's uh, titled the way that it is. The supplemental funding um, is meant to provide additional resources um, that were not included in the final agreement last year because it kind of came together last minute um, to kind of do the outreach education and training necessary um, because DEED is not administering this pilot program and doesn't have the resources to do so or kind of the expertise to do so. Um, and so that is the rationale for this request. Thank you. And Senator Pratt, uh, Senate Council tells me it's grants for loans. If that answers your question. Thank you, ma'am. Chair, and if, so if I may just make sure I understand, it's a grant to MCCD in order to, re, to refund their loan pool that they would then give out. 
potentially forgivable loans. And then, if I could, um, for Ms. Johnson, uh, and I won't go, you know, I won't go through the um, the interest rate tutorial that I went through last week, but um, can you help me understand line 1.17 and 1.18, where the fee of the interest rate shall not be higher than the Wall Street Journal Prime, and how that? And I don't have the bill that we looked at before that you testified on. How does that? Um, how does that compare to the? Um, to the changes we heard last week. Chair Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair and Senator Pratt. Um, and so I do believe you're referencing um, the deed package that was talked about in Senate File 4925, um, authored by Senator Putnam. And I believe, um, I'm just double checking here now, that the language, uh, the policy language is identical. The only difference is the appropriation amount is not listed uh, in the policy package, uh, but it is listed here in this in this bill. Senator Pratt, follow up. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair and uh, Ms. Johnson. Can you explain a little bit more about the types of loans you're making? Carrie Johnson. I may turn this over to Electra to answer that question. That's fine. Okay, Electra. Um, thank you, Senator. Um, the, the loans uh, range from $50,000 to upward of $300,000 and can be, you know, requested for any range of purposes. These are specifically targeted for economic development and um, including commercial purposes for both um, small businesses and commercial real estate projects. Thank you. And follow up, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so someone could purchase real property hard assets with these loan funds. Is that correct? Electra. Senator, that is correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, any other questions? Senator Draham. Thank you. I, I just had an amendment, Chair, um, the A1. Okay. Uh, Which... Senator Draham has the A1 amendment. Or moves the A1 amendment. You want to tell us a little bit about the amendment? Yeah, Chair, it's it's the same amendment I've been offering, um, adding some more reporting requirements um, to the bill. I know it's going to be laid over, but I uh, wanted to bring it to the attention of Senator Fate to the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Dreheim. I do consider it a friendly amendment. All right, Senator, so members, all those that are in favor for the amendment, please say aye. Aye. Okay. All those that are opposed, say nay. The motion passes with the amendment. Any other um, discussions on the bill? Thank you, Senator Fate. The bill will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, next, we have Senate File 4401, Senator Umover Baton. And if Andrew Peterson could approach the testifier table, that would be great. Senator Umover Baton, tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I'm excited to be presenting Senate File 4401 to you today, um, which will support Film North in building the next generation of filmmakers in Minnesota. I have Andrew Peterson, the executive director here with me today, um, who can share uh, more about this in detail. But just, just to give you a little bit of an overview, um, this bill is important to support and protect Minnesota's 25 million production tax incentive program by actually providing the skilled workforce that's needed to attract film projects in our state. We're so lucky to have Film North in Senate District 66 because they educate, they train, uh, they prepare workers to meet the current and future needs of the film industry. And because the jobs in the film industry are very specific and highly specialized, workforce training programs like this are essential. The current state of these training programs is really a patchwork of different programs. Um, some focus just on like production assistance through 
um, very short and consistent sessions. And the film community understands that Minnesota's long-term success in attracting film production to the state and building a robust film production community requires a well thought out and planned statewide training program. That's very key that it's statewide. Um, that would include one where all students are trained to the same standards and provided the same opportunities overseen by dedicated program staff uh, that offer courses on a regular basis throughout the year. A film workforce training program also provides the opportunity to train people who may have been excluded from this type of work previously to really develop a young workforce that comes from our increasingly diverse communities across the state to attract and retain people to high-skilled positions. Um, and why Film North is really uniquely positioned to develop this statewide workforce training program is because they have a 35 plus year track record in filmmaker services. They're already serving folks uh, across the state. They have partners across our state. They have a national reputation, a really robust membership base, and they have state of art facilities. Again, I'm just so proud to have them in my district and um, we'll now pass it to Andrew Peterson to tell you more. Thank you. Mr. Peterson, if you can introduce yourself for the record, you can begin your testimony. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew Peterson. I'm the executive director of Film North. I've been here for 13 years running the organization, and my entire career has been in filmmaking. Uh, I started, this program is, uh, speaks to me when I was younger. My first job as a location manager, I had no experience. I had mentorship, and my first job was on a $20 million movie where I made $1,500 a week. It's a highly paid uh, 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 jobs across the board here, but highly specialized. When you see those film credits and you see the names you don't quite, nobody quite gets, best boy, grip, gaffer, uh, prop master, each one is a specialized position and it's one that requires training. Right now, as the senator mentioned, there are some programs in the state that offer a one day workshop. That's not enough. Sustained engagement with an industry leader is needed. It's also something where uh, being trained to say Film North standards, which is what we would say, is uh, is something that will that will will immediately be recognized across the industry as we have a national input and are seen as a national leader. We're also somebody that is there 24-7, 365, to support filmmakers in these career endeavors. So uh, anybody who does even does do a short seminar or class with us is, is a member and stays engaged with us. Um, as the senator uh, mentioned, it, uh, there are Minnesota's diverse communities are really uh, not represented currently in the uh, in the workforce uh, for for the film industry, and much of the work being made in the film industry right now is uh, is made by people of color and from underrepresented communities. I would highlight just one: Sterling Harjo is the what's called the showrunner for Reservation Dogs. He's coming to Minnesota. We're bringing him to Minnesota uh, in June because he's looking to shoot his next project here. He wants Indigenous crew in front of and behind the camera. We currently don't have much. This is something that uh, if we're going to be competitive and have the projects that tell Minnesota stories, accurately rec represent Minnesota's communities, we need a crew base that, re that represents that as well. Thank you, Mr. Peterson, for keeping your testimony under two minutes. <laughs> um, members, any questions for Senator Umover Baton or her testifier? Senator Draham? I just have my amendment when it runs appropriate, Chair. Thank you. Um, will any, any Senator Umover Bain on the amendment? Madam Chair, is this the A1 amendment? Yes. Okay. Th thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Dreheim. I'll take that as friendly. Great. Um, Senator Dreheim moves the amendment, um, the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those that oppose say nay. The amendment passes. Um, any other discussions on the bill? Senator Her. Thank you, Chair Muhammad. I just have a question to uh, Ms. Mr. Peterson or even uh, uh, Senator Amuba Betum can answer it too. Um, so this money is not is to, for workforce development and, and not for grant. Uh, uh, Senator Amuba Betum. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the way that the bill is written is for D to grant Phil North to do um, this statewide training program, and I believe that would be considered workforce development funds, but you might want to have counsel weigh in on that. Senator Funger. Yeah, I just, I just wonder, um, 
aside from this legislation, uh, does Film North, North provide grants for um, filmmakers? Uh, we currently Mr. do. Mr. Peterson. Thank you, sorry. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, we have a grant uh, situ um, uh, uh, structure in place and uh, in, in processes as far as vetting people and, and mm -hmm. having a robust and uh, fair application process for all. Sure. Senator Hur? Yeah, Ma Madam Chair, I, I, I support this legislation. I just want to know a little bit more about Film North because my, uh, my uh, connection or touch base with the me media arts community has been you know, a um, long time past. So just back to the follow-up with the question, what's the percentage of um, grant applicants of community colors that you um, provide per year? Mr. Um, Peterson. Thank you. When I started uh, 12, a little over 12 years ago, it was under 10%. We're over 45% now. Um, it is, uh, there's, always, there's always room for improvement, but our grant, that grant in particular is for mid-career artists that I cite those, those pieces for, so that is about people that have been around. I'm really proud that of that. Uh, we are now seeing people that have come through our youth programs that are now being, getting mid-career grants. That shows sustained engagement from teen years until now and, and uh, having touch points with them along the way and supporting them as they build their careers. Thank Senator you. Her, is that all? Thank you very much. All right, any other questions, concerns? Sounds good. The bill will be laid over for possible inclusions. And thank you, Senator Omar Bayan. And next, we have Senate File 4816 from Senator Dornick. And I believe we have Eric um, with us on Zoom. So, and then, is that all? Yeah, that's all. Madam Chair, we have, I have one uh, other testifier, Mr. Lowry from Farmers Union. Oh. He's here in person. Okay, sounds good. If you can join us at the testifier table, Senator Dornick, please tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. This is uh, Senate File 4816, a meat cutting and butcher training grant appropriation. Senate File 4816 appropriates $375,000 from the Workforce Development Fund, a one-time basis to provide grants to uh, secondary career and technical education programs for the purpose of offering instruction in meat cutting and butchery. Grants may be used for cost, including but not limited to equipment required for meat cutting program, facility renovation to accommodate meat cutting, and training uh, faculty to teach the fundamental meat processing. Uh, the bill allows DEED to enter into an interagency agreement with the Department of Ag to run this program. This would allow MDA to, re to revive the Minnesota, or I'm sorry, the meat education and training grant that was funded uh, one time in 2022. And this bill reflects the language enacted in 20, uh, 2022 with the following changes. Of course, the dates are updated. The increase to the total appropriation is 375,000 versus the 350 uh, to ensure the unfunded requests are met. Uh, increasing the maximum amount to 75,000 instead of 70, partially for inflation. And fourth, uh, formatting change to improve the readability and technical changes recommended by the revisers. Uh, now, this is, uh, again, like a program that we had in 2022, very successful, and this will just kind of finish the funding. So with that, I'd like to introduce my two testifiers, uh, Eric Swatsky, Minnesota Association of Agriculture Educators, and Stu Lowry, Minnesota's Farmer Union. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator uh, Dornick. We will go with the Zoom testifier first. Um, Mr. Eric Swatsky, if you can say your name for the record and keep your testimony to two minutes. Yep. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Eric Swatsky. I'm an ag instructor at West Central Area Schools located in Barrett. Uh, welcome to our mobile meat processing lab, which is an example of some of the many labs that are being uh, created in schools statewide. A trailer was purchased with a USDA grant, uh, and our school also received a meat education training grant from the Minnesota Department of Ag uh, to install the electrical backup generator, potable water, and septic connections to get our lab up and running here just in a couple of weeks from now. Uh, we're one of nine of the schools that were selected for the first round of uh, grants, um, and I heard there was about $700,000 in requests in the first round. Uh, this 36-foot trailer has a stainless steel working spaces, a three-base sink, hand washing station, a meat grinder, mixer, and a stuffer, as well as a stone locket freezer. Students enrolled in our processing class have been preparing by learning about safety and sanitization and have begun to learn what different levels of permitting required to ensure that all meat in Minnesota is processed in a safe environment. I want to thank the committee for hearing Senate File 4816, as this bill will provide the foundational support needed to feed the meat processing work shortage. 
This committee has heard plenty of testimony in the past about the shortage of meat processors that quickly became evident in everyone's eyes during the earliest peak of COVID. Many steps have been made since that time to start to address this issue, but there is more that needs to be done. If we are to address the workforce shortage head on, we must start with as large of a talent pool as possible. By providing schools with grants to purchase the startup equipment and to upgrade teaching labs to provide for safe food handling, we will be providing a one-time boost that will sustain for decades to come. Currently, there are over 40,000 students enrolled in ag education in Minnesota. Just imagine the impact of even a quarter of those students receiving a basic introduction to meat processing. We envision that in the near future, meat processing will be an experience shared from the most rural districts to the most urban districts, as so many careers in meat processing are urban in nature. We need to fill the demand for workers in delis across the metro, inspire the next master chef to create new cuts of meat that will win the next James Beard Award. Mr. Slotsky, if you want to finish? Yep, and help every local grocer to have a talented pool of workers who know they're the way around the butcher block. Uh, I appreciate your support of Senate File 4816, and we'll take any questions. Thank you. And Mr. Lori, if you can say your name for the record, your full name, and begin your testimony, please keep it to two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Stu Lori. I'm the Government Relations Director for Minnesota Farmers Union. And on behalf of our organization, I'm glad to share strong support for Senator Dornick's uh, 4816 to establish uh, meat cutting grants for high schools. We support this bill not only from our longstanding uh, support for ag education, we feel like that's uh, hugely important, but also because it helps address a key workforce challenge experienced by our members. If we think back to COVID-19, the large uh, packing plants shut down because the workers got sick and the flex in that system was the small uh, regional meat lockers across our, our, our state. And so to address um, that shortage of processing, the Department of Agriculture went around and knocked on all those small mom and pop meat lockers and um, said, hey, can you uh, process more hogs? Can you take a couple more beef? And nearly to a one, they all said, well, we would, but we can't find any workers, right? So our, our state took really seriously uh, building up uh, the the, the, this new uh, workforce, we established two technical training programs at Central Lakes College and Ridge Rudder College. Um, but we also realized that there was a, a problem with getting that enrollment, and we needed to introduce folks um, to these careers earlier in their career, which is how we came to an appropriation to support uh, meat cutting technical training at, at high schools. Um, this is a, a good time for it, not only because of the need, but also as Mr. Sawatsky uh, illustrated, there's a big opportunity to leverage federal funds with these state funds and train up a workforce that we've neglected for now two decades. So thanks for your support of students and for your interest in this bill. It matters to us a great deal. Thank you, Mr. Lori. Members, any questions for Senator Dornick or his testifiers? Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Madam Chair. So pleased to be on this bill. I love this bill. And Senator Dornick, you're doing a great job. I just was wondering if this was ever going to make its way to education finance either. Um, just my, just my question. I sit on that committee as well, and I know sometimes they will intersect, especially in a bill like this. Senator Dornick. Madam Chair, I guess I would uh, defer to, <laughs> I guess she's shaking my, her head no. So uh, Ms. Fontaine, the counsel, to answer that question? I don't think so, but. Um, Madam Chair and members and Senator Gustafson, I, do, I don't think it would go to higher education. Um, we, a lot of times we have, for example, um, health care training in this committee, and those don't necessarily go to health and human services or another committee like that. Um, if this is sort of general workforce training, I do know that previously, I think Senator Dornick mentioned that this did go through the Ag Committee. Um, and so that in that time, then, of course, it was heard in that committee. But I don't recall or I don't know that this needs to go to higher education um, unless they were going to partner in providing um, the program. Senator unless Gustafson. you wanted to refer it there. But Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, no, I meant, and I'm sorry, not higher ed, but I'm on education finance, so K through 12. It just if it's coming to the schools and funding is being requested, just another possibility. So that was all I, I meant. I didn't mean to create extra work for you, Senator Dornick. Thank you. Members, I'm Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I have a, a, a couple of questions just to kind of understand a little bit better. Um, and, and whoever wants to answer can answer. Um, so this is being, as, as Senator Gustafson just highlighted, this is, 
This is being done at the uh, secondary high school level. Um, is the plan to have a program on site at the high school? And how are you going to deal with the liability of that? Or is it to be like a PSEO uh, where priority is given to applicants who are coordinating with Min State? I'm just kind of curious how that coordination works. Senator Dornick. Madam Chair, I guess I would uh, have uh, my testifier, Mr. Swatsky, address that question, if he would, if he's still on. Yes, Madam Chair and Mr. Senator. Swatsky. So to answer that question, yeah, we are actually working with Department of Ag inspectors. In fact, our inspectors are going to pass the inspection of this trailer, which is at our school. There are some of the schools that got the first grant use the money to uh, modify labs in the school to have drains, to have stainless steel facilities, to even have um, uh, new ceiling tiles put in that aren't porous so that they will pass full inspection. Uh, we are also working with the Department of Health, too. So uh, we are trying to make sure that absolutely everything is done as far as safety wise. Um, and the schools are really adopting this at a, a pretty quick uh, increasing pace now. So it will be directly in the high schools. It will be us high school inspectors doing the, the work. The uh, Redwater College and Central Lakes College do have programs, and we'll talk about uh, the current enrollment options in the future. But yeah, it will be right here in the school. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I was kind of, I was curious about the liability piece of it. You know, we've tried to, and Senator Dornick has, has worked in, in the past, and yeah. Senator Dreheim trying to get kids off. The, I, I believe kids need authentic experiences, which is why I appreciate what you're trying to do. But uh, we've had pushback from the Department of Labor at times um, over the safety of students. And I'm just wondering how you're dealing with that liability, because if I remember the butchers I've seen, they got these big bandsaws that uh, that can that can cut pretty quickly. Mr. Swatsky. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator. Yeah, so I was just looking and, and grinning. Our, we don't use a bandsaw at the high school. I've got a hand saw that we use. So if you think of the hand meat saws, uh, yeah, that's one piece we won't we will not use. Um, and definitely one of the things we'll be looking at is how do we work with uh, Dolly and, and youth skills training to be able to get kids experiences in butcher shops? Potentially, yes. Um, but definitely, you know, there's a focus that if they are in a career and technical education program, we can work with some of the pieces of equipment that typically aren't used in the work setting uh, for students under the age of 18. So in reference to those child labor laws. Um, and really what we're trying to do more than anything is the very basics of how to handle a, a meat knife safely. And then how do you cut a loin into one inch, an inch and a half, uh, and two inch chops, something like that. Um, there won't be a whole lot on the, on the front end talking about slaughter. So we would be taking, for example, in our program, boxed beef, the USDA inspected boxed beef, and then just break down that boxed beef. But we aren't starting out with in most cases. Senator Pratt, follow up. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and before I ask my next question, I just want to say how much I appreciate using the, the uh, hand tools. Um, I think kids need to appreciate the automation that we have more often. Kind of like we had to, we had to do, uh, we had to do things by hand when I was in high school. Um, but, Madam Chair, my, my question is around, and this won't surprise anybody: the 10 percent of the grant uh, used for. Um, uh, faculty training um, on line 1.16, 1.17, but on 1.15, we also have training faculty to teach the fundamentals of meat processing. And I'm curious about how that 10% works. You know, typically we see that as um, an administrative expense uh, to cover management of the program. And, and hopefully we've got, um, recipients that have the capacity to manage this program without taking away from the from the students but I'm interested how um, three and three B and three C kind of work together Senator Dornick Madam Chair so Senator Pratt uh, this I'll get to that I mean actually might, might ask a little help but this is a program that was started in 2022, so this has been going on. There's a sheet in your packet there somewhere that talks about the schools that have had it. So uh, we just took the bill from 2022 and pretty much just uh, did the same thing and just little tweaks that I mentioned in my first testimony. So with that, I guess I don't know if uh, Mr. Lowry or S Mr. Swatsky would have any more to add. Mr. Lowry. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Stu Laurie, and uh, happy to be uh, corrected by, by counsel for the read, but m my understanding is that the 10% would cap the amount that can go to number three. So they can get up to $75,000 for the overall grant. The idea would be the bulk of that needs to go to renovating that facility or purchasing a processing trailer like Mr. Sawatsky did, but the 10% of it can be used for uh, training faculty. And that is really, you know, there'll be an ag ed instructor but they might not have the necessary certifications in terms of uh, food safety or the liability questions that you mentioned, and they could go to these new programs at the technical colleges or attend them online and use this grant to support that work. Great, thank you. Senator Bogano. All right, any other questions? All right, sounds good. Um, we will, Senator uh, Dornick, this bill will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, and we have a small switch to the agenda. We'll have Senator Herr go before me. Senator Herr, you have Senate File 49 to 14. And um, you have a testifier, and I don't want to mess up the name, Dawi Zhang, Zhang, in cap Zhang, if they could approach the testifier table. And Senator Herr, sounds like you have the A2 amendment. Yes, Madam Chair, I have the A2 amendment. You want to tell us a little bit about the amendment? The A2 amendment should be in the members' packet. The A2 amendment just clarified the, the language. Um, the funding here is uh, more um, specifying going to um, Asian American woman entrepreneur. But the, length, the amendment is broadened a little bit, and later uh, my testifier can explain in more detail about that. But I uh, hope that this delete all will be the intent of our final bill. Thank you, Senator Herr. Senator Herr moves the A2 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those that oppose say nay. The motion prevails. Senator Herr, go ahead with your presentation. Um, Ma Madam Chair, Asian American are the gro are growing rapidly in population, especially in Greater Minnesota, becoming entrepreneurs at record level. Asian American are the fastest growing demographic group of entrepreneur in the country, contributing to our state's economy across many industry and sector, and yet they are they have struggled to recover economically from the COVID nineteen reception, and are often stuck in low wage sector and continue to experience anti-Asian discrimination both from the inside and outside of workplace and businesses. So, Madam Chair, Senate file uh, 4491, um, appropriate $1 million uh, in fiscal year 2025 to, as a as outreach support training, peer network development, direct financial assistance uh, to Asian Minnesotan entrepreneurs and business owner, and provide technical assistance to gain financial literacy skill, identify and connect individual to sources of private capital and navigate state and federal programs to support small business development. Uh, what we hear today is Tommy Shong, um, the ED for Coalition of Asian American Leaders, and we have a testifier, uh, Ms. Xiong, uh, Ms. Ka Xiong, here uh, next to me. So she, from what my understanding is, she will be speaking in Hmong, and Director Tommy Xiong will translate. That's why I'm sitting here at the other side of the table. Thank you. And members, there are also a few testimonies in your packets that are written. Um, Ms. Dalmi Zhang, you can go ahead, begin your testimony. Please state your name for the record and keep it to two minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. My name is Tao Mei Shang. I'm the Executive and Network Director for the Coalition of Asian American Leaders, also known as CAL. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak today. 
Uh, for those who don't know, the Coalition of Asian American Leaders is a statewide organization with over 5,000 Cal network leaders from all parts of the state with high concentrations in the metro area, St. Paul, Minneapolis, and growing populations in Worthington, Winona, St. Cloud, Rochester, Duluth, um, and multiple other areas. Um, we are a cross-ethnic, cross-generational, and cross-sector organization that works towards systems change through policy and advocacy, data and research, grant making, as well as leadership support. And um, the Asian American community, uh, through information from our network, continues to um, be challenged with the repercussions of COVID and the rise in anti-Asian hate, uh, specifically towards women. Um, in 2020, Cal did a report that demonstrated that Asian Americans in Minnesota were disproportionately impacted by COVID. At that time, we only made 5% of the population. However, we made up 6% of the COVID deaths. Of that 6%, 50% were among Americans who died. The, um, the death toll due to COVID has had significant economic impacts on our Asian American community. Um, for women especially, they continue to str struggle uh, economically because many Asian American women uh, are overrepresented in frontline low-wage jobs such as restaurants, retail, and personal care. And in a study in 2020, the Women's Law Center reported that Asian women, more than any other cultural ethnic population, experienced the longest term of unemployment, um, toppling over six months. In addition to that, there's been recent data uh, that demonstrates that Southeast Asian women make only 60 cents to every dollar that a non-Hispanic white male makes. Uh, this is pretty low compared to um, white women who make around 80 cents to every dollar. Ms. Zhang, if you can say your final sentence, we're over the two minute limit. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I will leave you with this. One, Asian American women continue to grapple with the recession of COVID and anti-Asian hate. Two, women, uh, Asian American women have the widest wage gap um, other than any racial and ethnic group. And then lastly, uh, due to anti-Asian racism and racial stereotypes, it limits Asian women's ability to finance, uh, get uh, financial institutions to help them finance their businesses. Thank, Thank you. you. And if you have more, you can send us a written testimony. And Ms. Cabjong, you can go ahead. Please state your name for the record and um, keep your testimony to two minutes. Madam, I'll translate for her, and then she'll say her testimony in Hmong, and then I will read her testimony that she wrote out. Sounds good. Um, กูญาลุงจงเซนพอกูมาเปตมิญอนจอดกูตุซีมาปล้อตู <laughs> นอจอมอเทียจอฮอลเลคคัมพานีสลีฮอแอสเซมบลีถอกุญอมรอเตกูกูตอมกะวาจอเตจอเตเทียตอมกะวาสะคนจอตะชีกูตะซอเตชะม
I came to the United States in 2005. When I arrived in the U.S., I was already 22 years old. Since I was uh, older, I did not get a chance to study in the United States and learn English. However, in Laos, I learned both Hmong and Lao. I can write both languages. I also studied how to be a seamstress, hairstylist, and a nail technician. When I came to the United States, I couldn't use any of my skills because I didn't know English. Instead, I had to work at restaurants and work in a medical assembly company. This was hard work, and I would only make about $15 an hour. After living in the U.S. for 19 years, I have dreams of owning my own business so I can support my big family. I want to have a clothing alteration store. I know I have a lot of skills, and I have ambitions to do more with my life. However, I don't have the appropriate savings, and I don't know enough English to do this on my own. In 2023, I had the opportunity to buy an existing clothing alteration store. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a loan, and I didn't have enough money to do it on my own. After this experience, I started sharing my dream of starting a business with my family and friends. This is when I learned from Durley about an organization that could help me and other women find resources. I believe that I cannot continue working this hard at these kinds of jobs. I can use my energy and skills to invest in my own business and help my family be more successful. Thank you. Um, members, any questions for Senator Her? Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, whether this is for Senator Her or one of his testifiers, I'm just curious. The, the, the bill's kind of um, ambiguous. It, it, it lists a lot of things that these monies can be used for. And I'm wondering uh, if you can help me understand how much will be going to direct financial assistance and how, how much will be going for uh, technical assistance? Senator Her or yeah, testifier, I think Ms. Ms. Jean will have a better answer at that. I, I would. Okay, Ms. Jean. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Pratt, fifty percent will go towards the grant making, and then um, twenty percent will go towards um, staffing and um, technical support, and then the thirty percent will go towards training. Um, for budding entrepreneurs to do work plans. And as you can tell, with interpretation, it takes quite a uh, quite significant amount of time to do paperwork and help do uh, translate interpretation. With the reminder that it's not only for Hmong Americans, um, this is for Asian American women, so there'll be multiple languages. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. So if 20% if is going to staffing, would that how is that different than what we typically see? Because there's no call out here for administrative expenses. Is it fair to say that that's a 20% uh, of the of the funds would be going to administrative expense? Ms. Jean? Uh, Senator Pratt, administrative expenses is probably a pretty broad term, but staffing will need to know multiple languages. So um, it's a pretty high cost. Uh, not many staff members can speak two languages, and because we require them to be able to speak two languages, in multiple languages, um, we'll need more than one staff person. Senator Pratt, follow up. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, if I remember right, having worked with Cal in the past, you do a lot of, of networking already. Is that a fair statement? You bring people together, you like interest is. Can you explain why we would need additional funds for peer network development in this grant? Ms. Zhang? Hi, Senator Pratt. I'm not sure. Um, our we call ourselves a network of leaders, so everything we do is around based around building community. And uh, this wouldn't be a networking experience. This would be technical um, expertise provided to budding entrepreneurs and current business owners. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, something to think about. I, I understand this will be laid over, but something to think about as we've drafted these bills in the past, I think we've been a little more clear on how much goes to financial assistance, how much goes to technical assistance, and I, th I think I'd like to see some more of that detail uh, in this bill as it, as it moves forward, Senator Herr, um, just so that we as a legislature, and I think Senator Draheim has an amendment for your bill um, that um, would help us understand those, um, uh, those expectations. Thank you. Senator Draham. Thank you, Chair. Isn't it amazing that Senator knew that I had an amendment? Um, yeah, I would like to offer the A3 amendment. All right. Senator Draham moves the A2, A3 amendment. 
Um, any questions, Senator Her? Um, uh, Madam uh, Chair Muhammad, can uh, can uh, Senator Hang sum up his amendment? Is it the the uh, guardrail more like? Okay. Uh, I believe it's the reporting amendment okay. by Senator Draham to your amendment. Yes, it, it's just reporting back to the rate that you in both bodies. A little more detail on, on what the fuck I'm uh, kind of what Senator Pratt getting to. Okay, Senator Hur. Thank you, Chair Muhammad, and I appreciate uh, Senator Pratt for bringing that, um, you know, like pie a percentage of the grant and also the uh, administration park and um, Senator Dre High Amendment will make it uh, clear, and I, I'm pretty sure um, Cal has a good track record of, of managing management, so you know things things will go smoothly, and I, I trust the organization. But having a clear language will be better, and thank you for the amendment as well. So I accept that as a friendly amendment. Thank you, Senator Dreham. I have a question. How come we didn't offer this amendment on um, Senate File? 4816 Senator Dornick's bill. Just question, just because I've noticed obviously we've been offering it to every bill. Does it already happen? That's, my understanding that was run through, uh, I thought that was a men's state program. Okay. And, and then, but I, I, I'd be happy to put some amendment on that if that moves forward, Chair Mohammed. Thank you, Senator um, Draham. And it sounds like that bill already has that reporting. So, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I was going to highlight that, that on page two, it has that language already incorporated in the bill, so it didn't need an amendment. Thank you. Um, all right, Senator Draham moves the A3 amendment. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 All, all those that are opposed say nay. The motion passes. Um, all right, to the bill, any other questions, members? No, Senator, her final question. Thank words? you, Ch Chairman Helen, and also thank you for being co-author with me on this bill. Um, this, this will lead to um, some success in the future. Uh, Senate File 4914 focus on addressing systemic barrier that, that's deeply rooted in our communities. Cal um, has a network and experience to do the important work to bring it to an even greater scale. And when women are supported, their family do better. It, it is time to invest in Asian American women so families and community across our state can thrive. So thank you very much, and I'll, I'm also honored to carry this bill too. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Senate File 4914 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Thanks. Next, we have Senator Hostchild, uh, Senate File 4609. Um, and if your testifier, Sean Walnitz, could approach the testifier table. Welcome back, Senator Hostchild. And we also have Jessica on Zoom. Please begin and tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for hearing Senate File 4609, a bill regarding the Entrepreneur Fund, appropriating loan capital to be used to lend to small businesses. The Entrepreneur Fund was born out of the need to diversify industry on the Iron Range in the late 1980s. Its two main priorities were to support entrepreneurs to start and grow small businesses and to renew, and to renew the entrepreneurial culture in northeastern Minnesota. The Entrepreneur Fund has grown geographically over the years and now serves 16 counties and five tribal nations in Minnesota, serving mostly rural communities. This funding is critical as rural businesses are typically severely underbanked and there is also a lack of business services. Providing accessible capital and services for small businesses to sustain and grow is critical to the health of rural communities and the regional economy. This appropriation will help the Entrepreneur Fund leverage other federal dollars for small business lending. Thank you for, t for your time hearing this bill and I do have two testifiers here with me. Mr. Wellnitz is the CEO of the Entrepreneur Fund and Ms. Letts, I think I'm getting that right, is the owner of Boomtown Restaurant in the city of Rice Lake. Thank you, Senator Hoshaw and Mr. Wellness. If you can state your name for the record and keep your testimony to two minutes. Great. Hi, Sean Wellnitz, uh, CEO of the Entrepreneur Fund. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Senators. Uh, as Senator Hostchild uh, introduced, uh, this bill is really critical for, for access to capital for small businesses uh, in rural uh, central and northeast Minnesota. 
since 2021, uh, we've seen explosive growth and a need for capital as, um, as uh, rural becomes uh, increasingly underbanked with bank consolidation and in the current credit environment, access to capital has become more difficult. Um, from a size and scope standpoint, um, just since the pandemic of 2021 over the past three years, uh, we have uh, averaged deploying $24.5 million each year to small business owners at an average size of about $63,000. And those go to business owners who have uh, difficulty accessing capital for a variety of reasons. Uh, could be a, a type of industry they're in. You're going to hear from a restaurant owner who is a startup uh, having to go through that channel of growing uh, and getting access to capital. Uh, could be those who have, uh, on the borrower side, maybe they have limited le net worth, they have lower credit scores, um, or they could be coming into a new industry. Um, but the need for our capital and services has continued to um, grow exponentially. Uh, and for us to meet these needs, we always need a mix of capital. These are just the loan funds that we can actually deploy out. This $1 million, as the senator shared, uh, would help us leverage an additional at least $1 million from the feds, and then we could borrow um, uh, up to a million, or up to additional $10 million, so up to $12 million this would leverage for us to get out to small businesses uh, in Minnesota. So thank you for the opportunity, um, and I'll turn uh, next for our time for our small business owner to share her story as well, too. Thank you. Um, Jessica, if you can state your name for the record and keep your testimony to two minutes, please. Thank you, Jessica Leitz. Um, I guess I initially opened a, a very small restaurant I was not able to get any funding for, and it was very difficult getting started. We were turned down by the banks. I was a restaurant worker, server, bartender, supervisor, um, while I was putting myself through college at UMD, and I was turned down. Um, it made things extremely difficult. I barely got the restaurant open and was pretty much banking on cash flow to, to keep us going for those first few months. Um, after that, I wanted to grow and expand my business. And I was connected with the Entrepreneur Fund at an event, and they were able to give me the funding that I needed to open my second location. Um, <laughs> Two years later, I went back to them again because they're great to deal with, and I opened my third restaurant, and we actually added a brewery to it. Um, and so because of the Entrepreneur Fund and the help that they gave us, we now own four different restaurant locations, and we have a whole catering division as well. We could not have done it without them. Um, in addition to the funding that they were able to give us, we also received other help from them. Um, as, a, as a small business owner and somebody that didn't go to school for business, there was just a lot of things lacking in my education and they offered support um, and they connected me with somebody that was able to teach me about how to get all of my accounts set up. They taught me QuickBooks, they went into Excel, they taught me all kinds of things that were I mean, not only beneficial, but absolutely necessary to, to run a small business. So they were there for all kinds of other support as well. Thank, Thank you for you. your time. Thank you. Um, members, any questions for Senator Hostild or his testifiers? Senator Draham. Thank you. i uh, wondering, is there any overlap with this area in IRRRB? Senator Hostile? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks, Senator Dreheim. Yes, there is, uh, I mean, substantial overlap, but it's not the entire coverage area of the Entrepreneur Fund. It's, um, it would be portions of St. Louis County, portions of Itasca County, portions of Lake, and all of Cook County. So um, we, I, I don't know if you guys have this map in your handouts. I apologize if you don't. But you can kind of see the coverage area for the Entrepreneur Fund going far beyond the IRRRB coverage area in, all the way to Senator Putnam's district. Thank you. Um, and the map is in your packets, members. Senator Draham, follow up. I'm, I'd just like to offer my amendment if I could, Chair. Absolutely. I have the A1. All right, Senator Draham offers the A1 amendment, which is the reporting amendment we've been putting on every bill. Senator Hostile. Yeah, I would happily accept the amendment. I think it's a great idea. All right. 
Um, Senator Dreham moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those that oppose say nay. The motion prevails. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and you know, my, Senator Dreheim kind of asked my question, but, you know, the IRRB does offer uh, some of these, some of these grants and loans. I'm wondering, understanding there's, there's an expansion beyond that. Um, do we have participation in the Entrepreneur Fund today with the IRRB? And how did we come up with the, the million dollar amount? Senator Hostow. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Pratt. I'm going to maybe defer to Mr. Walnitz about sort of the specifics on, on how they work with the IRRB and then the amount. Mm -hmm. Mr. Walnitz. Yeah, um, you know, we have a pretty uh, robust relationship with IRRB in terms of we've managed uh, grant program or loan pro programs for them in the past on a fee basis. Um, however, they have never, uh, they have not been a direct uh, funder of ours. I should say that back uh, maybe 2019, there was one, um, one allocation similar to this that they had plugged into that. Um, but typically how it works with IRRB is we will tend to get borrowers ready and grow, and then when they get to a larger size, an IRRB loan program is more... Um, sort of sufficient as they get to a bigger job growth, job size component. But as you'll know with IRRB, they're typically focused on very much job-related types of things where retail, restaurants, startups are not going to be in their kind of scope of services. So they lean on us heavily uh, for those uh, types of referrals, um, but they don't formally participate with us on an ongoing funding basis. Senator Pratt, follow-up? Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And and I think that's an issue that should be addressed at the IRRB because, you know, their their main responsibility is diversifying the uh, economic base of of the uh, iron range so that we don't have to rely on on taconite mining and, and go through the booms and the busts. Uh, but Madam Chair, uh, uh, we gave seven million dollars to the Initiative Foundation last year, uh, of which the Northeast Initiative Foundation was a part of that. Uh, really for an identical purpose for what's being proposed here. Can you describe uh, the overlap or why we're not overlapping um, with the Initiative Foundation on uh, on this request? Senator Hostow. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Pratt. Um, I certainly will pass to my testifier, but I would just say that it's clear from the work that the Entrepreneur Fund does that the initiative foundations do, that the unique work that IRRB does, that there is a plethora of demand for different supports from businesses, from different sizes, depending on their specificity or, or um, area of expertise. Um, the Entrepreneur Fund has continued to grow and shown success with supporting small businesses like Boomtown uh, with the previous testifier mentioned, not something necessarily that the IRRB would probably traditionally be involved with. Um, and so I think each of them plays a very special place in northeastern Minnesota, just like other regions. Um, but I think I'll let my testifier sort of explain maybe the um, unique aspects of, of the Entrepreneur Fund. But overall, I can say without a doubt that all three are very unique and special in what they do. Mm -hmm. Mr. Walnitz. Yeah, I would say the biggest distinction there is the size and scope and the holistic that we bring. So, so we bring both, as you heard from the testifier, the services and the lending. Um, and we are solely invested in small business development where those foundations often do multiple different things. And I think as a result of that, the size and scope that we work on is pretty significantly larger than the initiative foundations. You know, um, just by scope, we did, you know, $27 million in loans in 2022, and I believe they did about 1.8 or 2, 2 million in size. So for us to continue to capitalize and grow, you know, we always have to sort of stay ahead of the next pace of demand. Senator Pratt, follow up. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just wanted to uh, say that this, you know, we, we gave a lot of money to the Initiative Foundation for this very purpose. Um, I would have thought that some of that would have made its way to uh, the Entrepreneur Fund as a, as a partner. Um, and, and to Senator Hostile, while, you know, while you may see it as a plethora of demand, my concern is more around the fact that we've got uh, multiple entities trying to serve the same constituency. Um, and making sure that we as a legislator, as, as the appropriating body, um, aren't funding redundancies um, and, having, and having our, 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 our funding uh, compete with 
our funding to another organization. So I, I, I do think there needs to be some coordination um, in the fact that so much was given for this purpose uh, in, the, in the budget cycle. Um, I would just like to understand that coordination a little bit better offline, but thank you. Thank you. Um, members, any other questions for Senator Hostile or, his, or Senator Gustafson? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I was just trying to clarify with Senator Putnam about the initiative fund. But I just wanted to say I support the bill, and I just actually sent you an email to see if I could be um, added as a co-author. And I understand the concerns about saying, like, aren't these some of these things overlapping, or didn't they already get funding? But if you go up into these areas, and I'm from central Minnesota, and then up until I took this job and had more time, I was up in Duluth a couple of times a year enjoying the businesses up there as well. They just aren't you know, they don't have the same support systems that we have in the metro area or in the suburbs. If you want to start a business, and I came in late to the testifier's testimony, but I did catch the tail end of it, it's really, really hard to start a new business. And if you don't have some of those resources or those networks in place, it's near impossible. So I think, you know, I, Senator Hoschild is always the the most vocal and hardworking advocate for his district in that area. And I think this is just another example of that. When we talk about what comes before the jobs committee, it's all about how can we help business owners? How can we make sure that they're set, you know, being set up for success? I don't see anything in here that would be a waste to a new business owner or somebody wanting to expand. And we hear multiple bills that serve multiple needs all the time. So I don't see how that's any different. But um, it's not easy to start a business, especially in a rural area. I think things like this are always important, especially if we really want to give those people a fighting chance, just like people who start a business here, but maybe have a little bit more access to resources that they don't in rural areas. So just small town Minnesota kid advocating for more services. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Senator Hostile, closing words. Well, I don't know if I can say it any better, Madam Chair, than Senator Gustafson. Um, but I think we've shown that uh, the Entrepreneur Fund is a really special organization in northeastern Minnesota. Uh, they were created because of the downturn in the taconite mining on the Iron Range. And now they have grown to do a lot of, lot of special things just beyond the Iron Range. Um, and I think that's a testament to their good work. I think getting them a million dollars in the grand scheme of the support that we provide across the state to do additional lending, leverage federal dollars, get more money out the door to support businesses. That's a win-win-win in my book, and I hope that you'll help me support it. Thank you. Senator Housechild, um, your bill, Senate File 4609, will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, I will be presenting my bill, Senate File 3167. Um, and I will have Senator Putnam take over. Let the, let the record show I have the chair's blankie. Uh. Senator Mohammed, to Senate File 3167, if you would, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members before you is Senate File 3167, an appropriation to Fortis Capital. Fortis Capital, Capital aims to provide essential financial support to black, indigenous, and people of color, businesses, and entre entrepreneurs, along with enterprise and economically challenged communities. Here's how it works. One. Partner lender, Lenders Collaboration, Fortis Capital, collaborates with partner lenders who assess potential credit for participation loan based on standard analysis criteria, such as capacity to pay, credit history, and prevailing conditions. Two, uh, expanded access to finances. Uh, to financing. Cap Fortis Capital targets borrowers who require higher loan participation due to collateral or credit deficiencies. In its, in, its, in its initial stages, Fortis, Fortis Capital plans to grow through two key phases, 
infrastructure in investment, seeking $2 million in grants, forgivable loans, and private philanthropy to bolster infrastructure, including staffing and overhead expenses. Capacity uh, to capacity expansion, pursuing 10 to 20 million dollars in grants and low interest loans to enhance capacity, including expansion into the greater Twin Cities area and prospective statewide outreach. These funds will support initiative initiatives such as program related investments and EQ2 loans to, fos uh, to foster sustainable growth and increased impact. And Mr. Chair, I have with me the CEO of Fortis Capital, Mr. Jim Terrell. Thank you, Senator Mohammed. Mr. Terrell, if you would please state your full name for the record, commence your testimony when ready, and try to keep it under two minutes, please. Chair, my name is Jim Terrell. I'm the president. Uh, we have also at the uh, testifying table Brian Smith, the CEO, but I'll be doing the testifying. Uh, Jim Terrell, I'm, uh, as I said, president of Fortis Capital. The bill that we are asking for your support would appropriate $12 million as a one-time appropriation to Fortis Capital. Um, the packet that you have includes a flyer or brochure that has a good deal of information about Fortis, its structure, the uh, 16 loans that have been made since June of 2020, who they're uh, with, uh, a few brief statistics in the two minutes that I have. Fortis Capital has invested over 2.6 million in loans to businesses, leveraged over 12 million in private and public sector financing, aided in the creation of over 100 jobs, retention of over 90 existing jobs. And we've developed a very unique partnership with commercial banks and other lenders. Last year, when I had the privilege of testifying before House Committee, uh, the members were impressed that um, we aren't doing lending in such a way that it takes away from the system, but it works with the system. A typical deal would involve a private bank making a $400,000 loan subject to a $200,000 participation from Fortis Capital. So in essence, our presence in the deal enables a commercial bank to make a larger loan than they would have without our presence. Also in the packet, there are three or four letters of support uh, that outline how that works, uh, including the fact that many of the loans that we've supported would not have been made without Fortis Capital's participation. Your previous projects, the woman with the restaurant and uh, the um, project uh, supported by uh, Senator Herr, uh, individuals that couldn't get loans, that's exactly what we do. We buy risk from commercial banks to make loans possible that would not be possible without Fortis Capital. And so we've assisted several businesses in three areas of access to capital, financial, social, and knowledge capital. Mr. Tell, your, your two minutes is up. If you wouldn't mind uh, expediting or giving us the last couple sentences, that'd be much appreciated. We simply want your support for, for uh, Senate File 3167. We thank you for the opportunity to uh, present. Thank you very much, Mr. Terrell. Mr. Smith, as long as you're here, do you have anything that you'd like to add, or are you here merely to respond to questions? Chair, uh, yes, here to respond to questions. That's okay. That's right. So members, do you have questions, comments, or concerns for the testifiers, the bill's author, Senator Pratt? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Well, I, for one, was fascinated by the discussion on risk mitigation, and I'd like to uh, hear more about it. I think the testifier had a little bit more. Um, I was sorry that he hit the two-minute limit and I'd, I'd like I'd like him to to inform me a little bit more about this risk mitigation maybe complete your testimony Mr. Terrell if you would please thank you Mr. Chair thank you Senator Pratt is that correct yeah yeah thank you Senator Pratt the risk mitigation is done through what we call loan participation uh, it's standard in commercial banking and with sophisticated CDFI lenders so in a typical deal, uh, you might have a $500,000 building that an entrepreneur wants to, to buy. That's a lot of what we do is help first-time commercial property owners actually be able to afford and get a property. They have $100,000 down. The bank looks at a $400,000 loan from a cash flow point of view and determines from their analysis that the business can support that loan. But from a collateral point of view, as Senator Mohammed mentioned, collateral deficiency is something that's run into often. They will contact Fortis and say, we would make a $400,000 loan to ABC Company, provided Fortis that you buy a $200,000 participation. Sometimes we're at par on the mortgage. Sometimes we're subordinated to them on the mortgage. 
We were created and funded by a national foundation, Living Cities, to the tune of $2 million to take more risks than commercial banks take and make possible deals that wouldn't happen otherwise. So I was so excited to hear your previous testimony testifiers talk about inability to get loans, inability to get loans. That's exactly what we've done for the last four years is help people get loans through that participation model. Thank you, Mr. Terrell. Senator Pratt? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, uh, I spent a 30-year career working in risk management in the banking sector, and so that's why I was so intrigued by the, uh, the risk mitigation program. Um, this won't come as a surprise to the members of the committee, but I'm, I'm looking at the 10% uh, to be used for uh, operating costs. Uh, typically, especially for a program this mature, I would hope that there's the capacity to uh, manage the program already within um, within your current structure. Can you help me understand that how the how that 10% would be 1.2 million would be reserved, Mr. Chair. Used? Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, uh, part of it is uh, something near and dear to your heart: risk management. Uh, there are new Cecil Bank regulations that we are also governed by. Our accounting firm, Baker Tilly, has caused us to, if you look at our audited financial statements, have a very, fairly significant loan loss reserve because we are taking greater risks. And so in that $1.2 million, uh, there would be, yes, administrative cost, loan loss reserves, lending reserves, and the like. And so uh, to some of your earlier questions, I think they could and should be broadly classified as administrative expenses. But we are required to maintain a fairly large loan loss reserve as a part and, and literally to segregate it from other funding. So part of that would be to fund loan loss reserves, part of it would be to fund standard administrative costs, and part of it would be to expand. We've done what we've done with two employees, Mr. Smith and myself, and we were volunteers for the great majority of the existence of Fortis, only beginning to draw salaries last, May, uh, last July. I'm sorry. So we intend to hire three more staff people by the end of this year. Okay. All right, thank you so very much. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, just one follow-up and comment. I don't know if Senator Dreheim's got a, an amendment for this one or not, but uh, Mr. Chair, I, under, I see that this is a one-time appropriation available until expended, and I don't know how long we would expect it to be expended, but in the reporting section, it only requires a report on December 31st, 2025. Um, you know, if we expect these funds to be utilized over that time, and I would sure like to see the, you know, have have it reported back, uh, the repayments, particularly since we're talking about risk mitigation, uh, replenishing the, the loan funds so that we as a body aren't continuing to, to refund these these corporate these these loan pools that they become somewhat self-sustaining. Um, I'm not quite sure how long we're expecting those funds to be available. Whether a one-time uh, report is appropriate, whether it should be annual reporting, but um, I'd like to work on that. As, presuming this is going to be uh, held over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Senator Pratt. This will be laid over for possible inclusion, and that would be some information that can be shared. But I'll go to Senator Muhammad just to make sure that what I am uh, articulating is, is true. Senator Mohammed. Yeah, thank you, Senator, uh, Senator Champion, Chair Champion, and Senator Pratt. My understanding is the need is really great, um, and that they are expected to hopefully spend this within the next two years. But they don't want to put a timeline on it. But I'll, I'd be happy to work with you on what that reporting should look like as the bill will be laid over. Any follow-up, Senator Pratt? All right. Any other questions? If there are no other questions, if we can have Senator Muhammad give us her final words before we lay this bill over for possible inclusion. Thank you for considering this. And um, I think there is a clear understanding that um, there are many businesses in our communities that don't qualify um, for traditional loans um, in our traditional way of banking. And they are filling a great need that we have. And I appreciate you for taking it into consideration, Chair Champion. Thank you so much, Senator Muhammad. Thank you to the testifier. Sorry that I wasn't here to be able to hear all the wonderful things that you said, but it's recorded, and I'll go back and take a listen. So thank you so much for being here, uh, and have a wonderful day. With that being said, Senate File 3167 will be laid over for possible inclusion. And now we will go to...
Uh, Senate file 486069 from Senator Champion, and uh, and I will ask the vice chair to come to the chair. Madam Thanks, Chair, Senator. whenever you're ready. Senator Champion, you can begin your testimony. Thank you so very much. Uh, Madam Chair and, and committee, thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak briefly about Senate File 4869, which is in, uh, Inspire MSP. Uh, we are asking for an appropriation of $75,000 from the Workforce Development Fund. That would go through uh, deed, needless to say, and, uh, and it would be a grant to, of course, we know all the reporting requirements and contract requirements with deed to develop programming to assist middle school age children in Minneapolis and St. Paul to, to develop an interest and connection with, creative, with the creative industry. And with that being said, I have my testifier that is here, and he will tell you a little more about Inspire MSP. Thank you. And uh, Dan, please state your name for the record and keep your testimony to two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Dan Ryan. I'm the Executive Director of Inspire MSP, and today I want to hit on five things. First, why we're here. Minnesota ranks amongst the top 10 of the creative industries in the U.S., um, and is only scheduled to continue to grow, uh, but we significantly lack diversity in the industry. Number two, our part to system change. Inspire MSP uses the phrase, you can't be what you can't see most often. 87% of our historically excluded students are considering what they will become and what they want to be. So Inspire MSP co-creates these experiences with our students, exposing them to creative places and roles throughout the metro, including uh, organizations like Hennepin Theater Trust, Minnesota Twins, and the Opus Group to list a few. Uh, third, our impact. In the first year, we had 293 schools, uh, students from schools across the metro. In our second year being this year, we have 800 students um, across the metro. We started with six partner schools and we are now up to 18 partner schools with a wait list for schools, students, and uh, future partners. Fourth, how we plan to use the funds. We uh, plan to work with our partners, US Bank, Best Buy, continuing to build a partnership with Deed to develop and deliver our program experiences at the level that we've already established. Uh, and fifth and last, I'd like to leave you with a thought from a student, Kale, who is initially a skeptical St. Paul ninth grader um, who noted on our Target Center field trip just a few weeks ago, uh, and I quote, this was the best and most impactful field trip I've ever been on. It really opened my eyes to what career I want to pursue. I was def it was definitely life-changing and makes me want to become more determined in school because I want to be surrounded by this. Just as our students are considering who they are and what they want to be, right now, I encourage us to look right now at how we want the future of the creative industry to be more diverse and inclusive. Thank you, and thank you for keeping your testimony to two minutes. Um, Senator Champion, I have a question for you. Um, how did you guys all come up with the $75,000 grant? I will defer to my testifier. And maybe I could just do the follow-up as well. Um, and how will that meet the needs that you guys have? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, initially, when we laid out the budget, the goal has been always a third, a third, a third of our overall budget to look at grants, state funding, and corporate and individual giving. Um, the 75 amount would closely meet that third at the time. Uh, based on the demand and the future um, of the program, what would meet that demand would exceed 100000 to meet the third that we uh, were planning on with state funding. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, and I think you asked, uh, what will the, I think you're saying 75000 was your thought, but now 100000 and what will that get the committee? You, you already indicated that you, you serve 200 and some odd kids. Will this allow you to serve more? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, we currently have 800 students in the program. 
And what this will allow us to do is to enable more experiences and more in-depth programming that gives context to those experiences and then further connections throughout the industry, just like our first uh, presentation with Film North, I believe it was, uh, we could become then that uh, pipeline feeder to programs like that. Thank you, Mr. Ryan and Chair Champion. Um, Senator Draham. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think I have an idea to how to make the bill better by offering the A1 amendment. All right, Senator Draham moves the A1 amendment. Senator Champion. Uh, if I can see that A1 amendment, but I'm certain that it, it is about reporting and doing all the things that should be um, welcome, we will see that as a friendly amendment. All right. Um, so Senator Draham <coughs> moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those that oppose say nay. The motion passes. Madam Chair, you noticed that I, I, I almost thought I was the only one saying aye, that even Senator Draheim didn't say aye for his own amendment, but he eventually said aye. So I just wanted to show him that we were in, in sync with each other. <laughs> Thank you. Um, oh, Senator Draham. It's There's a little bit of delay on mine. I apologize to Chair. Um, members, any other questions on the bill? Seeing none, um, this bill will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you, um, Senator Champion. Um, members, that concludes our business for this meeting. We will not meet on Wednesday. I'm sure you all will miss me. So if I don't see you all, enjoy your break. The committee is adjourned.